We're so honored and blessed to be a part of this wonderful interview with Mike Sherrard, who has become an absolute legend in this industry in a really short period of time. So, Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about what led you to real estate. Yeah, definitely. We'll talk about that. And then we'll, we'll get back to that very pivotal question. Um, you know, for me, I being driven in, in university, you know, I kind of went the typical route of once I started getting to the tail end of university, I started reading typical books, rich dad, poor dad, and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, and I just realized that there should have been a better way because my entire family are engineers. Uh, my dad, my sister, all my uncles, all my cousins. Um, <laughs> and, but I, you know, I was actually sharing this with somebody that was uh, with me last night for a bit where you know, I remember when I was like 12 years old, I was driving through my hometown with my dad of 12,000 people, this tiny little town back in New Brunswick. And I'm, I'm a big car guy. And I remember telling my dad in our like 12 year old Toyota Corolla, because we were broke, um, like dad, one day, uh, I'm going to drive to work in a Lamborghini. And he's like, well, that just doesn't happen. Um, and I was like, okay, well, it, whenever anybody's ever, you know, said something's not possible, I just like to go kind of silent and prove it. Um, so as I went through university, I started realizing there's a better way. Um, and, you know, it's really funny, because I hated realtors growing up, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be a realtor. My parents have sold 100% of their house without a realtor. Um, so when I made that decision, it was more so because I liked the idea of real estate investing, um, but I wanted to learn marketing, branding, and sales. And I realized that, okay, well, I could get into this space, if you will, and then learn these skills, and then I can go do something else um, afterward. But I fell in love with the industry as soon as I, I got to work. And it's funny because I fell in love in a way that is not you know, how most people will fall in love because I door knocked every single day for three hours a day, seven days a week. And the first day that I door knocked was in the snow and minus 10 up here in Calgary. Um, so not many people would think there's a lot to love about that. But for me, I've always loved doing things that I know others aren't willing to do. And that's what kind of was my driving force is I loved being out there with my hands freezing to the point where I couldn't even write contact information down uh, because I knew no other agent was willing to do that. And I that's always been kind of like my driving force is outworking people and doing what uh, the average or the lazy is not willing to, to commit to. So on that, Mike, why do you think that most realtors fail so epically? Yeah, it's, it, you know, this is an important one. It's probably going to be one of the biggest takeaways for anybody on this call. People need to understand that real estate is very, very easy. It's one of the most simple industries in the world. All you have to do is get clients and fulfill it. And in order to fill it, all you have to do is get clients. So your job is one role, get clients. And there's only a, a handful of ways that you can actually get clients, which is prospect, leverage social media, you can, you know, leverage your sphere, you can, you know, expand on your network by going to different events. But at the end of the day, it's a very, very simple business. The problem with most people is because they come from a corporate background, or because they come from just the educational system, they've got no discipline, and they've got no accountability. And that's the problem with a lot of agents is they focus on doing the stuff they want to do. Every single person knows what they need to do, which is, you know, the way that I approach my first year of real estate, and I had this conversation with my group the other day, um, where I wanted to look back at the end of my first year, and be able to consciously say with my hand on my heart that there isn't one single thing I could have done more to crush it in my first year. So I door knocked, I cold called, I put out videos, I ran ads, I went to networking events, I hosted networking events, I did the traditional side, I did the modern side, like there isn't a single thing I could have done. And I fucking hated all of it, right? But the excitement came from the fact that I was building momentum. So for agents that are not where they want to be, it's not because you don't know how to get to where you want to be. It's the fact that you're not doing what you know you need to be doing. Because when we come from an educational background, or we come from a corporate background, 
The problem is, is that the repercussions are immediate. So if you're in a corporate background or a corporate nine to five, and you don't do the stuff that you know you need to do, well, you've got a boss breathing down your neck and you could get fired. If you're in the educational system and you don't do the assignments that you need to do, you get a big fat F and you have to go redo it. Well, in real estate or solopreneurship or entrepreneurship, if you don't do the stuff you know you need to do, there's no immediate repercussions. The repercussions are delayed. You go broke in six, 12 months, but you don't feel that today. So people will say, oh, it's like literally this morning. It's gorgeous outside. I should go golf. No, you should fuck a prospect for three hours. Like, you know, it's, it's doing the stuff that you don't want to do for an extended period of time in order to earn the right to do what you want to do. And that's kind of, you know, the funny dynamic and why I took photos. You know, I've never deleted the photo on my Instagram. You go back and look in 2017. Like I documented the door knocking and the hell that I went through so that now when I'm at this place, a lot of people just think, Hey, I want to, you know, do what Mike's doing and just put out free videos and make a few million a year. Well, I went through the trenches for many years to get to the point where I can earn the right to do this. Not many people want to earn those stripes. They want to go straight to the fruit of the labor today, and they don't want to put in the work to actually build the foundation to actually get here. Well, you know, true words have never been spoken. I, I've been in real estate since Clinton was in office and owned five Century 21 franchises and was recruiter of the year globally for Keller Williams. So I had been working with realtors for, for a very, very, very long time. And um, it, the, it's so interesting because I see agents come into the business that have great connections, great looks, great charm, great sales ability, and they wash out immediately. And I see people that can barely tie their shoelaces, but they work and work and work and work and work. And the universe has no choice but to reward that work ethic. So you, you hit the nail on the head. You're, there is no substitution for putting in the work. Definitely. If anybody ever find one, finds one, please call me first, you know. So when, when an, an agent comes to you that's been on the struggle bus, you know, an agent that's been in the business for long enough that they're they're thinking about getting a real job and, and you see the struggle in their eyes, what's the first thing that you tell them? Yeah, it's 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 that's a really good one. And it's really funny because my answer is kind of the reverse of that, which is it's not the first thing that I tell them, it's the first thing that I ask them. And I think this is a really important for everybody, especially if you guys are focused on agent attraction. Um, I, you know, questions as and Connor's the master of this, but questions control conversations, statements don't get you anywhere. Um, so the thing that I was asked for people that are struggling with their real estate business, so I asked them, why did you get into this business, right? Because the problem with most people is most people give up because they forgot why they got started right? Anybody that gets into real estate got started because they wanted to create a better life for themselves, a better life for their family. They wanted financial freedom. They wanted a flexible lifestyle. Like they got in for a reason. You talk to any agent that's literally just passed the real estate license and they're ready to run through a wall and take over the world. Well, what happened between then and now, right? So a lot of times, you know, this is why we actually go through the exercise with our group is to make sure that you create a vision board, and you know why you're doing this, because the problem is, is that most people are so used to letting themselves down and disappointing themselves that if they do it again, it's become the norm. But the problem is, is that you need to associate your goals and why you got into this industry with something bigger than you, which should be your family or something like that. So if you've got your family on a vision board, that is the background of your screen, it's the background of your phone, it's physically in front of you, when you don't feel like doing certain activities, now you can look and say, well, I'm not just disappointing me, I'm disappointing them, I'm disappointing my kids, I'm disappointing my spouse, I'm disappointing my family, if I don't do the stuff that sucks in order to give them the better life. So we usually need to kind of say, hey, oftentimes, it's not that you're not doing the right things. It's oftentimes not what you do, it's how you're doing it. And you know what you need to do, but you need to approach it differently. We need to get that fire back into you as to why you actually got started so that you don't give up and check out your time from this industry. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is so powerful. Uh, my own personal story with vision boards. So in uh, 2018, uh, in order to really build out EXP, I spent 305 days on the road, 305 days. And um, then uh, the kind of the, the end of that was I had enough time and money freedom that I could live anywhere I wanted. And I knew that I wanted to be in the Mi Miami metro area, right? 
So I packed up all my stuff, moved, you know, put everything in boxes, moved and um, unpacked everything and put my vision board up on the wall. Right. And at one of the places that I had was an oceanfront, um, oceanfront Donald Trump building. Right. And um, the most fascinating thing is that I'd been in uh, Hollywood and I moved into the 39th floor of Trump Hollywood, a, a $4.9 million apartment. You know, I went from, from, a two bedroom apartment to a $4.9 million apartment. And um, I went to get my hair done at one of the other Trump buildings a few doors down, like about a mile and a half down. And that's the actual building that I had had on my vision board. So what I did is I actually moved into a newer Trump building than the one I had on my vision board. So there, there's something that we don't understand about the, the power of that. Um, so anyway, I appreciate you touching on that. Do you think that a part of it is people just don't have a a big enough why yeah i think and and this is like you know I'm, I'm glad that this is i'm sharing this with our little family here and not the entire company because i'm sure i piss a lot of people off uh but um you know at the end of the day there's a reason why i will never check out right you see a bunch of agents at exp that get to a certain level and then they just check out and they're living in where we we all know where they're living um and they've removed their time from the business and now it's really funny because as you're seeing the market shift they're all trying to get their time back into the business because they're losing a ridiculous amount of agents because they checked out they're living this incredible life the gap between them and everybody else not only is so big, but they've made it feel so big that now there's a disconnect. There's no culture. There's no um, kind of connection within their organization. And now they're losing people because the market's shifting. They lost that. Um, and I think a lot of people you need to have a bigger vision as to why you're doing this because I'm the typical, you know, person that they talk about in like movies and books and stuff, which is like, you know, you can have everything in the world, but you can still be unhappy. And I'm like, hell no. When, once I get this car, once I get this penthouse, I'm going to be the happiest person in the world. But then again, it goes back to the quote where it's like, uh, they say it's, it's lonely at the top. Well, that's not true. It's lonely at the top if you don't bring anybody with you. So now like my vision is how many of my buddies in my, in our rev share organization, can I bring across the finish line to help live the life that I want to do? And now I'm starting to see it. You know, this is the first year I've got a couple agents that are going to do over a million dollars in GCI. And my goal is to up a thousand people make a million dollars. So now I'm on this mission that's more impact driven. Um, and that's what leads to fulfillment is when you make it bigger than yourself, because if you just make it all about yourself and material items and things like that, that is very short lived in terms of the satisfaction you're going to get from it but when you start changing lives and you start creating an impact and you know i get messages from people that from our own group saying mike just because i've been in your group i've quadrupled my production but i've got a better relationship with my spouse and i've been able to have more time with my kids and like i've gotten over fears and limiting beliefs and low self-esteem and all of these yeah. things that is the fulfilling part so i think a lot of people need to make sure that they're thinking bigger and as connor always alludes to you know you you need to stage your goals right mm -hmm. and i'll kind of talk about my goals i shared this briefly with my group i'm not going to do it you know publicly but you know you you need to have short-term mid-term long-term goals lifetime goals and afterlife goals right so you need to start thinking about like what are your goals for when you're literally gone right? And that's what you start to look at is legacy and impact and generational wealth um, that you could set your future up for success. And, you know, I think it's one of these things where it goes in stages. You know, I had very selfish goals between when I was 24 and broke and had $1,500 in, $1, in my bank account to now. And my goals between 24 and 29 was I wanted to get a Lamborghini, wear a $200,000 watch, which is behind me, get a penthouse, um, make seven figures a year and have a million dollars cash in the bank. And four months before I turn 30, I've hit all of those goals. Uh, but now going into that next phase is a lot more kind of, uh, relationship goals in terms of like my business partners and personal and friends and family and all of these things and experiences. So your goals go in stages. So there's nothing wrong with having goals that are materialistic. There's nothing wrong with having goals that are personal, but there's stages of where you need to graduate from that after you've done it, because you'll realize that that doesn't fulfill you. Um, but it's important to kind of go back to what you're alluding to Tracy with manifestation and uh, looking at what you really want to do because what you focus on expands. And one of the things I see all the time with agents at eXp is they're focusing on 
oh my God, this brokerage is copying EXP. So now I'm going to lose agents or, oh my God, the market's shifting and it's not a fucking joke to sell a house for a hundred grand over list price in 14 minutes. I actually have to do work now. Like, you know, they start, they're always focusing on the fear side of things instead of the opportunity side of things and what they need to do in order to hit their goals. And this is why, you know, the, the last thing I'll say on this is I had two realtors, uh, top agents that came over to my penthouse two days ago uh, that are going to be joining me from Remax. And they're like, Mike, do you see what this guy's doing at, at EXP in Calgary? Do you see what this person's doing at this brokerage in Calgary? I'm like, dude, I follow zero agents in real estate that are outside of my RevShe organization. I don't follow any of them. So if you're in my city, I don't know what you're doing, how good, how bad, I couldn't care less. My blinders are on and all that I focus on is my business partners. If you're outside of that, to me, transparently, you don't even exist. Wow, Mike, that is so incredibly powerful. I, that is one of the most profound things I've heard anybody say in, in a really, really long time. Um, you know, what, what do you think caused that shift in your mentality where you're focused only on the people that you can impact and serve? What, what, what was that transition like for you? Yeah, it actually started back in production. So a lot of people know me for the attraction side. And, and ironically, I actually came to EXP because I was the top one of the top producers of my past boutique brokerage. And uh, I came for the icon program and six months out of the business, I uh, got out of production. So, you know, for me, one of the things I struggled with as a new agent is, you know, comparison is the death of joy. And I always was following other realtors from Calgary. And I was following the agents that have been in real estate for like 10, 15, 20 years. They've been in the luxury space forever. Their parents know everybody under the sun in the, in the wealthy affluent communities. And what I was doing is I was like struggling to get a freaking deal over here. And I'm seeing them post on Instagram, all these million dollar luxury properties are getting, selling, touring, all this. And like, it was, you know, people need to understand that real estate or business in general is not a game of intellect. It's not a game of who has the most money or the most experience. It is a mental game. It is a mental battle. And the ones that have the strongest grit and the mental fortitude will win every single time. And that was affecting my mindset because I was comparing myself to all these people though. I'm like 10 days in the industry. They're 10 years in the industry, but I'm still thinking, why do they have this listing? And I don't. So what I had to do is say, okay, I know the concept of like, if you get 1% better every day, I know if I get 1% better every day, then I will get to the point where I don't have to worry about what anybody's doing, right? So when you start focusing on what other realtors are doing in your market, that's just ultimately distracting you from doing the stuff that you know you need to do. And now I'm at the point where like, I don't have to compete against anybody because I'm number one of the company. So just by focusing on myself, all you need to do is, again, remember why you're doing this. And you'll always see, for everybody on here, your biggest enemy and your biggest competitor is the one that looks you in the mirror every single day, right? Wow. So if you can get outside of your own head, that's going to change your life. Man, deep, deep stuff. Oh, my God. So tell me what your typical day is like. If you've had a, like, tell me what a really good day looks like for you. Yeah, Warm as day. boring as it freaking gets. It's so funny because <laughs> like everybody thinks I live this crazy life. I'm like out driving my Lambo all the time and like traveling and stuff. And uh, a lot of people ask like, Mike, why don't you do these day in the life like videos on your YouTube channel? I'm like, dude, you want to see a time lapse of me sitting here for 16 hours a day on fucking Zoom calls with agents? Like that ain't interesting. Uh, I'm sure what I say on those calls is interesting, but I can't disclose that. So when, <laughs> when we look at this, my day is like, I get up at four, I go to the gym at five, I come back, I start working at seven. And then I usually crush out you know, agent calls from people that are looking to join. And then I run masterminds for my group. And then I work on projects to help my group scale. And then I go to bed and repeat. And that takes 16 hours a day, seven days a week. So I sit here, which is why I feel like an 80 year old trapped in a 29 year old body. Uh, Cause I freaking sit here all day and crush. And, mm -hmm. but again, it goes back to why, like I had somebody ask me the other day, I get a lot of people on my zoom calls actually ask, especially the new agents, because unlike most that have, you know, they start getting a few subscribers and they think they're fucking special because they put up free YouTube videos and now people get attention. Like they don't have calls with new agents. They don't have calls with like any agents. They pass it off to some minion. And then now that's why they can't attract or can't retain because they've made it impersonal. So the reason why I convert so high is because I get agents that show up to the call. They're like, holy crap, I didn't know it was going to be one-on-one -on -one with you. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I actually care about my group. 
Uh, it's not the Mike Sherrard show. It's the Wolfpack show. I'm going to help you change your life. This isn't about me. It's about you. So for me, I don't have to do this. Like I could literally be doing whatever I want all day, every day. Uh, but that's not my mission. My mission is to help all my partners and make sure that if they introduce somebody to me, they convert every time. If somebody comes to me for my content, they're going to feel welcome um, and supported. And I do this all day, every day, because I know the power of it. And also, a lot of people and this goes for production, and it goes for agent attraction. A lot of people stop doing the stuff that got them to where they are once they start seeing momentum, right? Mm. So you see all these people that are, you know, living the, the dream life now. Um, but they they disconnected themselves from the Red Shoe organization, they stopped running mastermind calls and being involved, they stopped put leading by example and putting out content, uh, and speaking and hosting events. And for production, they stopped the all of the things that got them to be a top producer. And what a lot of people don't realize is like, hey, you can lose this all tomorrow. So right. I want to make sure that I position myself that, um, you know, if, if things are going to go sideways, I'm number one, going to be in, in the best position I can. But number two, if it really goes worst case scenario, I can build it all back up. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we all hope and pray that EXP will live forever. You know, like at, at EXPCon 2019, um, Glenn Sanford year, Glenn Sanford said, here's to 10 years and 100 more. OK, and if there's anybody, in my humble opinion, that can pull it off, it's Glenn Sanford, because permission to speak freely, I think he's the smartest person I've ever met, you know, in, in my entire life. And um, however, if it doesn't, you're exactly right. We want to be able to have a solution for our organization. You know, if somebody develops an app tomorrow and does to us what, you know, Air, uh, what um, Airbnb did to the hotel industry or what Uber did to the taxi industry, then you're right. You've got a group of people that that look up to you, follow you and, and are looking to you for that leadership. So what you said is so impactful that what you're doing is not teaching people how to sell more real estate. You're teaching them how to have a better life and using systems and tools that could be duplicated if it had to be in a different industry above and beyond real estate. But very, very profound. It's that's pretty profound from a, a 20, a 29 year old. That's for sure. So you talked about getting up at, at four o'clock. Um, there is no substitution for getting up early. Is there? No. And, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people ask how I got so much done. Like I went from literally $1,500 in the bank account to multimillionaire in five years. And as somebody Jeez. young in a new city that nobody knew, like, and, and people ask like how, um, and my answer to that is I, I compress time. Like mm -hmm. when you look at this, if I work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, like I do, I get done in five years, but the average person gets done in about 10 or 12. So right. by getting up early, and this is the thing, a lot of people that have kids or they've got uh, other things on the go in their life, and they always say, well, I don't have time. It's like, no, you do have time. You just don't make it. Um, mm -hmm. And your, your schedule is always going to show you what your priorities are. So I know that mm -hmm. if I can get up early and get started on the day, um, I can get more done before noon than the average agent gets done in their entire day. Um, mm -hmm. And the best part about being in the morning is like, there's no distractions. Most people aren't up. You're not scrolling because there's nothing new on social media. Like mm -hmm. you're just putting in the work. Um, and so I've, I've always done that for the last seven years. Um, and it's been a huge difference in just kind of catapulting your day into the, into the right kind of motions. Yeah. Mary Kay said you can do more between five and eight than you can between eight and five. And, yeah. and that definitely is, is rings very, very true. Um, you know, people, people, you're right. They look at you and they think that it's a, it's all glamorous. Um, and it could be, but, mm -hmm. but my goodness, to front load your to front load your career this way, you can help so many more people. So tell me about, uh, tell me about the books that you've read in the past. Let's talk about the books you've read in the past year that have had a strong impact on your life. Yeah, it's, it's, that's an interesting one. I'll kind of look behind me at a couple of them here. But, um, you know, it's, some of my books are going to be maybe not the best supply to everybody but depends on where you are. And I think that's a really important thing is like, 
I consume knowledge and information based on where I'm at in my business and my life today. So mm-hmm. like one of the, one of my favorite books is hundred million dollar offers by Alex Hermosi, um, mm-hmm. which is helping people understand like basically how he went from zero to a hundred million in four years, um, how you can create irresistible offers. And a lot of people will say, well, that's for like a product or a service or whatever. Well, technically yes, but it also comes down to how can you create an irresistible offer as a value proposition for your rev share organization, mm-hmm. right? So like I look at these books that are kind of in ancillary industries and say, how can I pull that into real estate? Because now it becomes innovative where everybody is just saying, well, that book wouldn't apply to me. Um, well, it does. You're just thinking linearly. You're not thinking in a creative way. Um, so that's been um, one of the good ones. Primal Leadership is another good one. Um, that I've recently read, because again, as a revenue organization uh, leader, like it's different than what most people are thinking. Like it's most people don't understand that it is drastically different from being a top producer to being a top leader. A lot of people think because you're a strong agent, you can be a strong leader. It couldn't be further from the truth because strong agents only have to care about three things, me, myself, and I. In a revenue organization, you have to care about 1200 people and their business and their feelings and their emotions and their families. And, you know, it's, it's a completely different space. Um, So you need to work on developing these skills because similar to anything in life, we're not taught them. So thankfully I've got Connor who's, you know, the best sponsor I could ever ask for, who's really good at this stuff. Um, But on top of that, I like to kind of bolt on what can I learn um, as well. And then if I look at, um, Oh, this is a really good one. Um, 170 uh what is it 177 uh secrets of the met um what is it 177 mental toughness okay 177 mental toughness secrets of the world class that's probably been the number one book that i've read this year um and the best part about this is it's a guy that worked with all the he was a performance coach and he worked with all the number one people like in in tennis it was like roger federer and all these like he was he worked with the number one in every single sport globally um and trained them so what this book is and i love it because it's so consumable is it's like it per page it'll have like two of these secrets so it's very easy very bite-sized but it'll be like hey here's what the average does here's what the uh top one percent do right and it's it just flips your mindset as to okay you know the differences are so subtle but now you start to realize how you can approach everything in life as the one percent would do not as the average and what you'll see a lot of times is you're doing it the average way which is why you're living an average life um so that is probably the most consumable most applicable book um that i've been able to get through this year absolutely brilliant Uh, jim Rohn says that uh you'll be the exact same next year as you are this year except for the books you read the seminars you attend and the people that you spend time with so uh talk a little bit about self-development how much money would you guess you have spent on your own personal self-development yeah i spent about eighty thousand a year um on different things and and you know, I, I think obviously wearing my Arte shirt here and, and I built a, a good relationship with Andy Frizzella and Ed Milet and being in the Arte group. And that's been really incredible. And, and you know, again, you you are the average of the people you surround yourself with. So if you're, you know, this is where a lot of agents go wrong is they're surrounding themselves with five people that suck at attracting agents. <laughs> what do you think you're going to do? You're probably mm-hmm. going to struggle to attract or they surround themselves with five other new agents that haven't done a freaking deal. And they want to mastermind about how they can get their first deal. It's like, dude, none of you know how to get a freaking deal. That mastermind's useless. You're all <laughs> going to be broke, right? Like surround yourself with people that are crushing it. Um, so like when I go to these Arte events, which are $20,000 for two days, every single person there, there's always a hundred people that are there. Every single person there in different industries are all doing over seven figures and they all want to help you win. Like, it's really cool when you go to these events because it's not like, oh, what can I get from you? Everybody's like, who the heck can I connect you with to help get your business to the next level? Um, and it's surrounding yourself with people that are, are similar mindsets, similar in drive and, and want to achieve the similar things. So um, that's probably been the, the biggest group is um, being in that RT program with those guys. Because again, most people know that Ed Milet built WFG basically. And that's a tiered structure like our model. So he understands how to lead organizations. And then most people don't know that Andy Frizzella, the founder of First Form, um, they ended up scaling the business by introducing a tiered structure through influencer marketing in order to compensate people with affiliates in a similar way to EXP. So both of these people have built their wealth 
through tiered structures. So when you can learn from people that have done it in a similar space, that allows it to make it much more applicable to you in terms of leadership and growth and things like that. Yeah, well, boy, man, that, that's absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Of course, we're all going to be in Dallas uh, to see Tony Robbins here in just a few days. Um, and and you're right, the 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 real magic of those kind of high end, big ticket events is not what you learn from the stage; it's what you learn from from the the people that are there. And you oh, yeah. you have to seek out those people because I can promise you, you're going to be there. You're going to be surrounded by a bunch of people, but every person that comes into your proximity is going to learn a whole lot more than if they go find a vacant seat at the bar, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. One, one of my good friends, Ben Morton, talked about how he was working with a success coach and the success coach told him, you know, you can make a hundred grand a year drinking and doing pot and all that kind of stuff, you know, partying, but you can't make a million dollars a year doing those kind of behaviors. And that's what people really, that's what separates the 1% from everybody else. It's, it's what you do when everybody else is at happy hour, you know, yeah, it's what you do while everybody else is sleeping. hundred percent. And, and it's, it's, you're exactly right, Tracy. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. here's, here's a really kind of unique nuance that, that I can share with people that should hopefully make a difference for the handful that actually apply it, um, which is. It's, you know, we all know the concept of like, you know, your success is is going to be a reflection of what you do when nobody's watching. But simultaneously, the thing that I always think about, and this is kind of a mental shift that I, I kind of went through, which is start to work as if your biggest role model is looking over your shoulder. Right. So the way that I would approach is when I was alone, what I would do is I would think like before I knew Andy Frizzell and Emma Led they were like my idols or maybe for you, it's Tony Robbins or Gary V or whoever the hell like look and start to work every single day. As if, if, as if Gary is literally sitting beside you auditing what you're doing, would you be scrolling relentlessly on social media? Would you be going down the rabbit hole on YouTube doing a bunch of useless shit? Um, would you actually prospect? Would you actually do what's on your, like, would you do this? If the multi-millionaire, billionaire mentor or role model that you have in life was sitting there hovering over your shoulder, watching you every single day, and you'll realize that you will work in a different capacity if you start to think in that way, uh, because you're not going to waste time because you wouldn't want to disappoint them because they're going to call you out, right? So a lot of people just work behind the scenes as if nobody's watching, um, but that's not the truth. So that's that was kind of a mental shift that I went through that really made a big difference in my work ethic. Oh, wow. That's, that's incredible. I've never heard that. I've never heard that, that thought process. My goodness. Yeah. Everything would change. Um, so what are you, what are you seeing this as the market is shifting, pivoting, mm -hmm. uh, whatever word you want to use, what, what is, what is working right now for real estate agents that are active in production? What is getting results right now? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, we all see the market shifting. And, and again, in, in markets like, you know, Colorado and Florida and, and Texas, it's not getting hit as hard, but there's other markets that are starting to feel the pressure a little bit more and, and who knows where that's going to go. Um, but this is the most exciting time. And, you know, this is why we always call it separation season, because, you know, as the market starts to shift, You've got, you know, we'll use 0809 for an example, and not to say that it's going to get like that, but 60% of licensed agents didn't renew their license after 0809. So where did the clients in those 60% go to the 40 that weathered the storm, right? So this is the biggest opportunity to gain market share. And this is why, like, even from my own business, and then I'll go back to the question, like my own business is, you know, when times like this start to happen, most people stop, spend less money on advertising. I double my ad spend, which is why anybody on here don't even go, bother going to my Instagram, you'll never get rid of me because I will literally follow you with ads every single day on every single platform. Um, and, you know, most people stop, start putting out less content, I just increase my cadence of content, like most people regress, and I like to double down. Um, you know, right now for for uh, the production side of things, what we're seeing working with a lot of the top agents is now we've got an excuse more than ever to to reach out with a, in a value driven way to clients because of how quick interest rates are changing and because of how quick things are happening in the market. So before you, when the market's hot, you kind of reach out to your clients and say, you know, are you looking to buy or sell? But now you can say, hey, here's how the last interest rate happened this week that's going to affect your buying power or the valuation of your property. So I think as we're heading into this transitionary period, you number one, really need to focus on 
the database that you have. And I think a lot of people screw this up because most people don't understand the concept that the cheapest deals you're ever going to get are the ones that are repeat and referral. And the reason being, and this is why anybody in the e-commerce space or the product space will always tell you the cheapest products you will sell are from people that have already bought from you. So the cheapest clients you'll get are people that have already bought and sold. And the reason being is because there's a pre-established relationship there. Whereas the mistake I made in the beginning is that I was always trying to find more, more leads, more clients, new people. But when you look at it, you can either A, get a repeat and referral from your database, which is going to be free, or B, you can spend a bunch of either time, energy, or stress going and getting somebody new, bringing them into the top of funnel, nurturing them, following up with them relentlessly. And then hopefully you're going to get them to the point to agree to the appointment, get the appointment. Maybe you get it. Then the, like... It is so expensive time-wise and money-wise to get new clients. Start to service and go deeper with the ones that you already have. Because if you properly service somebody in your database, on average, the stats say every single person that you've worked with should turn into seven more deals over the lifespan of your career if you properly nurture them. So that's seven Xing your business over the lifespan if you just nurture what you already have. And most people forget about what they already have. So my recommendation right now in terms of production is to really lean into um, your database, but also start leaning into brand um, and brand equity, because this is a bit of a delayed gratification approach. But when you start looking at the market turning, it usually lasts six to 18 months, however long it's going to be. But the ones that come out the other side with mind share are going to be the ones that dominate. So it's like, it's not just real estate in terms of physical real estate. It's like mental real estate in terms of how many more people are you top of mind with. So that's why I'm, I'm urging people to put out more content um, than ever and start to dial in the quality of their brand. Because real estate used to be the more people you know, the more deals you get. Well, now we're in this unique modern era where it's the more people that know you the more deals you get, or the more agents you get. Think about it. The majority of the 1200 agents I have, I didn't know who any of them were, but they all knew me through my content. So now we've transitioned in this phase where you really need to start thinking about what makes you unique and why give people a reason as to why they should work with you. And I think that's where a lot of agents are going wrong with production is they're saying, well, Mike, I want clients coming directly to me. Well, no shit, we all do but nobody knows why they should be coming to you, right? You're not special just because you're you and you care so much and you love helping people and you want to make a difference. So does every other agent in your market. So you need to give people a reason as to why they should reach out to you. And most people don't do that because nobody knows your story. Nobody knows what makes you unique. Nobody knows your unique value proposition. Nobody has any understanding as to why you're different. You're just telling people you're different. But if you could show people, your business will change forever. And so how, how can an agent really, and, and I, I, I had the, the wonderful blessing of selling my five Century 21 offices six weeks before the market crashed in 2007. And so I, I saw the whole world melt down with cash in the bank and uh, the, the smartest guys and the, the very best, the very best at what they did were wiped off the map because they didn't, they didn't do exactly what you're talking about. Their attitude was, well, I'm, Everybody knows me in my town. Yeah, but you weren't delivering the value anymore. So, yeah. man, incredibly, incredibly deep stuff. So, how how do you do you coach your 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 wolf pack on the best ways to talk to their clients? How how do you convey this with your clients that you're the person to work with? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, this is different for every single person. And this is something where you need to kind of reflect and and, you know, the the way that I was approached this in the beginning is and actually, I just put out a video on, on one of my business partners, YouTube channels about this, um, where I like to fill in this kind of sentence, which is mm -hmm. like, you are real estate and blank, who is the best at blank. So the first blank there is going to be your passion, your hobby, your unique visual cues, something like that. And the second blank is going to be your unique value proposition. So mm -hmm. for me, it was I am real estate in cars, who is the best at amplifying people's exposure with social media for the sale of their home. So mm. for me, it's like, what skill set do you have? Or do you want to go learn? Are you the best at golf front properties? Are you the best at waterfront? Are you the best at move up first time home buyers relocation? Mm. Like, who do you want to service? And then what is the unique aspect of you that people are going to take note of? 
And mm. then from there, that can start to be conveyed to the messaging of your content, where you can start to cater it to the people that you're actually trying to attract, right? Mm. So I think it's people people need to understand with their message and their brand and their unique value proposition that it is not static and it's not momentary today. So what I mean by that is your brand is going to be dynamic. It's going to change over time. So is the messaging and who you're working with, but simultaneously it should be future paced as to where Mm -hmm. you want to go. So like if -hmm. you're not yet a luxury agent, Start saying you're a luxury agent, catering how you look, how you dress, how you right. act, um, everything into luxury, because then that will lead you to there. It's not faking it till you make it. It's just future pacing where you want to go, right? Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people just need to think about what makes them different. And that's going to be different for every single person. Um, but you need to find a way to answer that. Because the question I always urge people in our group to think about is if you're in a listing presentation and mm-hmm. the seller said, you know, Mike, why should I work with you over the number one agent in our city? Mm. What would your response be? And Mm. if you can't answer that question, you need to get back to the drawing board because you are going to go up against some of the top agents. And if you just, your response to that is just, I love helping people. I love working with people. I'm going to care so much about you. That ain't it. Uh, Mm. That's not going to cut it. So you need to really reflect on these things. Yeah, the, the nastiest, most vulgar word in sales is I, yep. because you're right. No, no one cares about, you. no one cares about me. And, you know, yep. I mean, I know some people do, but if I'm, if I'm, if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to serve a client, the last thing that they want to hear about is me. They, they, they want to know why they are better off financially by working with my organization. So you've got a master. I, I, you follow me and like, you're the second thing. Anytime I go on Facebook, you're the second face that shows up. Okay. So (laughs) you're like my hero in that. Tell us a little bit about the masterclass that you've got coming up. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I've got my free training that, uh, you know, helps agents leverage video and, and, you know, that's been, uh, it's been really cool because I've seen the power of it. You know, there's agents, um, that are in my organization that are on track to do 100, 140 million dollars this year in production from their free videos on an iPhone as a second year agent, just following what I share in my training. And that's, you know, why I, I put it out there. And it's, it's funny. It's like, yeah, of course, like, I want to do it from like a business perspective. But I also do it from an impact perspective, because I've seen the power of what video does, that one of my goals is just to make the real estate industry a better place. And if I can help change an agent's trajectory of their business by introducing a new proven strategy, that's going to give them the flexibility they want and the lifestyle that they're looking for. Well, I've had endless agents that are not even with EXP or with EXP, not in my rev share organization being like, Mike, I applied your strategies and now I 5X my production in the last 12 months or whatever. Like to me, that again goes back to impact and fulfillment. So if I can help make an impact of getting more people on video, more people having clients come directly to them, um, that's ultimately something that I feel like is a job well done, um, just making an impact with the experience that I have. Uh, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about, about the things that you leverage out. Tell me about the things that you have somebody else do so that it doesn't clutter up your time and energy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, looking to do a lot more of that when I come back from build. Um, but one of the things was getting a, a VA and, mm-hmm. you know, having somebody that again, like I respond to all of my personal emails if there's something that I need to respond to. So like, for example, if somebody asks like from our rev share group or from my program, or just in general, a question um, about like how to get access to something, all these like kind of monotonous questions, I outsource all of that. Um, I also now look at time as the most precious commodity because it is because you can't buy it back. Where like Mm -hmm. I outsource all my video editing, all my funnel design, all my graphic work, all my ad management, um, all like all the maintenance of uh, my Facebook groups and things like that. So I try and outsource Mm -hmm. every single month, I do an audit of what tasks could I get somebody else to do. And Mm -hmm. now I'm at the position, uh, very fortunately, where to me, it's like, it's not about how much does it cost to outsource this? It's just, can I get the right person to do it? The cost doesn't matter, because I'll make that up by reinvesting my time back into what I do best. Mm -hmm. Um, But outsourcing is incredibly important in creating leverage. And this is an exercise everybody should be going through is calculating your hourly rate. Yeah. Right. If you don't know that you're going to make a lot of mistakes because I see a lot of agents designing a thumbnail on Canva for an hour 
well, you can get somebody in a different country to do that for ten dollars. So if you're mm -hmm. trying to make six figures, but you're spending an hour doing something that costs ten dollars, you're valuing yourself at, at ten dollars an hour. That's below minimum wage. You ain't right. never making six figures. So it's important to really look at this kind of litmus test of okay, I make fifty dollars an hour. Then great, anything below twenty five dollars an hour or even fifty, uh, I'm going to outsource. With the caveat being that as long as you reinvest that time back into income producing activities like yeah. prospecting and mm -hmm. things that are actually going to get you more business. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, goodness, boy, is that true. And, you know, another thing I see a lot of agents get distracted with is we all understand that we want multiple streams of income, right? You're yeah. supposed to have seven uncorrelated sources, but people that have that are wealthy, that have seven uncorrelated income streams, they didn't start working on seven. They started with one, made a tremendous amount of money, and then were able to add other ones without it interfering with their primary business. And, yeah. and my goodness, can you talk a little bit about the shiny object syndrome that so many realtors get wrapped up in? Yeah, this is, it's a really good one. And, and then, you know, maybe we can open up to questions too, Tracy, is, um, you know, a lot of people are always looking for more, they're looking to introduce more things into the business, they want more strategies, they want more platforms, they want more con and that's not it. Like, if you look at a lot of people that are successful, they do very few things very well, whereas the average agent does a lot of things very mediocre or very terribly. Um, so like, if you look at my business for, for what, you know, as an example, I've become the number one personal attractor at eXp, all that I do is put out YouTube videos. Like that's how 100% of my agents, you know, come to me. So for me, it's, it, you know, again, it's the concept of what gets measured gets managed. And a lot of people don't measure anything. So they don't know where their clients or their agents are actually coming from. So they can't properly manage it because they're doing a bunch of things that they don't know if it's working or if it's not. So they're doing it blindly with assumptions. Whereas I take a data-driven approach to say, where are these people coming from, clients or agents? And then I use that to determine where I should be spending most of my time. And a lot of people, when they come to me, like I've got an icon agent joining, um, doing you know 50 deals or so, about 40 million a year, and he wants to go to the next level. And my recommendation to him is not, start like what more can you do it's wh what can you do less of and eliminate and get deeper at doing that's already working for you right so it's about going deep and getting better instead of trying to do a bunch more stuff and just cluttering your time right anybody that i know that crushes it like brent gove right he does his events that's like the one thing brent does like and he does it really freaking well right so if you look at all these people that crushed it they did one or two things extraordinarily well and became a master at it to the point where you don't have to worry about all these other distractions and a lot of people are chasing that shiny penny where they can't commit to anything right and they're you know they're kind of trying this this avenue for three months and they don't get the results they're looking for so they start a different one try that for three months don't get it you know this is a delayed gratification approach right and i want people to really understand that if you're going to commit to something commit to it for the rest of your career don't commit to it and say if i don't get something but within this window of time i'm not doing it because anybody's proven that can work in any which way but my recommendation is to become a master at one thing or two things um, and filter your business down so that you can be very linear with your focus and channel your energy in very direct ways. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Who's got a question for Mike? Let's see if we have any questions here in the chat or if anybody wants to just like raise your hand and unmute yourself. I'm more than happy to kind of answer anything about production, attraction, exciting stuff coming up a build whatever i could do adam what's like, up, let's, like, let's let's uh answer this one uh yeah what's your advice for new agents brand new what's agents it? newly licensed brand new agents newly licensed um so for new agents i think it's an interesting proposition where again it's what i did in the beginning which is i wanted to try everything and then once you try everything for about three months then you start to look at the data of what has actually been successful and then ch uh, channel your energy into that lane, right? Because the big mistake for new agents is they just see people like me or whoever, and they're like, well, I just want to take that route and put out videos. It's like, dude, you have no idea what I did to get to the point where I can just put out videos. So in the beginning, as a new agent, what you should be doing is you should be choosing one proactive traditional aspect of scaling your real estate business 
And then you should choose one reactive modern way of scaling it over time. So my recommendation is you have to understand that the content and the modern way of doing things is delayed gratification in nature, where it's more of an exponential curve. You're going to get like no results for six months. Then it's going to hit an inflection point and skyrocket. Well, how can you offset those six months and still get clients? You have to put time in doing it the hard way. So choose one avenue of traditional prospecting, door knocking or cold calling, and then simultaneously pair that with one or two platforms that are going to be the modern way, which is like YouTube and Instagram, or for example, and then run both simultaneously. And that I think if you commit to that, you're going to be in a pretty good way. But again, my recommendation to, to wrap this up uh, for that question is it's not what you do, it's how you do it. I see a ridiculous amount of agents that get told by some coach that probably has never sold a home in their life, like we all know who I'm talking about, um, saying, go make 300 calls a day and you're going to be successful. Well, the problem is, is that people go try their KPI or the key performance indicators making 300 calls. So they have no intent of getting contact information on those calls. They're just banging out calls in order to get to the volume play. My approach to prospecting was I don't want to leave that doorstep until I get contact information. I'd rather knock 50 homes and get 10 contact information than 300 homes and get one. So for me, you have to understand that it's what you're doing it. You've all seen it. How many times have you gone to the gym and seen the same fucking person that looks the same as they did last year and they're in the gym every single day? And so what are you doing? right? It's not what you do. It's how you do it. And then you see somebody that goes to the gym, like, you know, Jeremy Kane in my group and loses 52 pounds in 75 days. It's like, he has a different approach to the gym than the average person. So you guys need to take very serious thought into how you're doing these activities, not just the act of actually doing it. Man, well said, Adam, you got your hand up, buddy. Open up your mic. Mike, what a legendary call, man. Just reminds me of every other Tuesday when you just spit in fire. Um, Thanks, man. I just want to ask, so you're, you've got a big focus on agent attraction. Who are your like influences? Cause you, you put out a lot of great content and I'm curious of like where you kind of get your ideas from and who you might follow or what you read to, to come up with those ideas. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, I appreciate that. And it's, it's a really great question. So what I've always tried to do is look at people outside of the real estate industry and see people that are crushing it. And then I want to bring that into the real estate industry because now it becomes fresh and innovative, right? So uh, for me, like uh, with the book, $100 million offers, I follow Alex Ramosi because it's without question the easiest, the, the most valuable YouTube channel in existence. Um, so I follow his content and see how can I apply his strategies to real estate. Or I look at like, again, Andy Frizzella from like a culture focused perspective, I look at M. Milet as being uh, the master of managing emotions and being able to relate to different styles of people. So I have all these people that are kind of external to the real estate industry, but bring certain things to the table that I think if I apply it here, it's going to be unique. Um, so ultimately, that's been my kind of three is Alex, Andy and Ed, um, for my industry, at least. Um, because I think if you pull it into this space, you're going to have a completely unique approach, which is pretty difficult because it's, uh, it gets pretty repetitive over time. I see Candace. Good morning. Hey. So, uh, Asian attraction, as you know, it comes with attraction. So how do you balance all of the agents that may hit you up? That's one of the, my so that's why I kind of kind of go back and forth with sometimes not wanting to do a lot because they do inbox you and they do want to call you and text you. And so how do you balance so many people contacting you and or leverage that? Yeah, like, you know, for me, it's, you know, people have to book into my calendar and go through a funnel and, and answer all these certain questions in order to get into my calendar. And if you say like, well, the first question in that meeting is, do you understand this 30 minute call is specifically about joining my group at eXp Realty? And if they say yes, I take the call. If they say no, I delete the meeting and don't even say anything to them because they're wasting my time. Um, and I think again, it's, it's important to look at, you know, your questions. Like, I don't think people understand what it's like to get, to really get too many people reaching out to you. 
right? Like, so, so that's one thing I hope people understand, because if you're on this call and you don't yet have a thousand agents, you do not have too many people reaching out to you. And it's then finding ways to streamline that. Um, because again, if you lead with value, if you put out the right content, if you explain EXP properly, you don't have to do a full EXP explain. My calls are now 30 minutes. On average, they last 11 minutes before somebody joins me at EXP. I get to the point, I'm like, hey, I def the only question I ask on agent attraction calls is, tell me what's going on. And then they vent about all the shit that they hate at their current brokerage. And then I loop it back around with everything our group does. And it takes on average at a 98% conversion rate, 11 minutes for somebody to join my group, right? Because I've front loaded it with all the content that educates them. Um, so that alleviates me from having to do full presentations. And then I'm able to kind of make it very tactical. I want to get to, to Henry's question here quickly before we wrap up, because I know we're on, uh, on a time crunch. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Hey, Mike, thanks for uh, sharing more knowledge. You know, I've been following you for a while. Out of all the social media, you know, which one do you get the most um, the most from? Which one do you think is the, the one you actually YouTube. Really focus on? YouTube, right? Because, and, and I don't just say this because like I, I do it. I say this because again, it's controllable. With, with, with YouTube being SEO driven and owned by Google, it's the number two search platform owned by the number one. Um, it's the most controllable. Like when you're putting out content on Instagram, TikTok and shit like that, um, you're basically throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what sticks because you have no control over that algorithm and you're just hoping to God it hits and connects and goes viral. Uh, with YouTube, you can control how a video performs if you know how to properly optimize, which again is shown in that free training. Um, just go click any of my links or YouTube videos or whatever. But uh, YouTube is, is the best because also it's evergreen, right? If you put out a video on any of these other platforms, it dies within 24 hours. You put it on a video, on YouTube. Um, my video that I put out two years ago about EXP is now still attracting agents on a daily basis. So um, focus on things that are evergreen, focus on things that create leverage. Um, and will ultimately, again, that's why the, here's the last nugget that I'm going to give you guys before we wrap up, because I know everybody has to leave. EXP is exactly like YouTube. And what I mean by that is that EXP or YouTube has a bunch of content creators and they put out value to the to the community of YouTube, and then you can make ad revenue. Well, the creators that bring the most value to the platform in terms of entertainment, education, or impact are the ones that are going to get the most ad revenue from YouTube. EXP is a bunch of agents that are bringing value to the marketplace. The agents that bring the most value to the marketplace are the ones that are going to get the most revenue share. So if your revenue share in your organization is not where you want it to be, it's because you are not bringing enough value to the marketplace in order for that to be reflected through the company's compensation plan. That's powerful. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Tracy, it was great to connect with you guys. I know thank we were in the you. backgrounds coordinating this. We're a couple minutes past the the hour here. Mike, any last words for everybody before we jump out of here and get on with our days? Yeah, as as uh, good old Brent always says, big brother over here is, uh, you know, big decisions are made a big event. So if you guys aren't going to events, that means genuinely that you aren't taking your business seriously, because there's always a way to make it uh, your business, you will see every time you go to an event at EXP, you come back with fire excitement, a completely new energy and level of drive. Every person from our group that goes to these events comes back and crushes it. We've got 77 people from my group going this year. Wow. A year ago, we had 12, right? Wow. So make sure you bring people, make sure you leverage this, bring guests. It's the best opportunity to really understand. It's one thing to hear about EXP. It's a different to be at an EXP event where you can feel what it's like to be here. Um, so again, you should make it a non-negotiable priority to make sure you're at every single exp event because the return on that time invested is not going to be directly immediate but it is going to completely change the trajectory of your business every single time and that lifetime value of that investment of your time will be something you will never be able to calculate so uh make sure you show up at these events if you see me there come say hi i'd love to take a picture and hang out and you know jam out for a little bit do anything i can to to help you guys win Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Mike, Tracy, everybody that spent that time with us today. So, hey, get out there, go crush it.